So uh, let me just give a very brief introduction to Bob. Uh, some of you know him, some don't. To those who don't, he's basically the godfather of the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Uh, Bob gave a great talk at the symposium a few years ago on the history of the Tucson Show and how it evolved from a bunch of people in a common room to the monstrosity that the show is today. And uh, if, if you're curious to see the talk, it's available on DVD from Blue Cap Productions from Brian Swoboda. After he gave that talk, he told me something startling. He said, Rob, you know how old I am? I said, I don't know, 60-something? He said, no, I'll be 90-something in, a, in, a, in, a, in another year or two. I saying, I got to come out here. <laughs> That's Bob. I said, I said, I don't believe you when you told me how old you are. <laughs> and so he said, how about you wait a few years, and when I've had 80 years of traveling the world collecting, let me just talk about stuff. And uh, I said, OK. So I have no idea what he's actually going to talk about. Neither do I. <laughs> but he's been around a long time. And I just want to tell you one quick personal story about how I met Bob. Um, in the 90s, I was a nobody. I was in undergrad. Uh, and then grad school, and I'd put up these little things called websites. And I was one of the first websites on the internet. And there were people worried about how the internet would destroy the hobby of mineral collecting. Long story, obviously the war was won. And in the, uh, in the late 90s, there were a group of dealers that petitioned to have me removed from the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. I had a small dealer booth sharing with some older folks I knew. And the issue was, was the internet a threat? to mineral collecting. It was the early days, this was before Google, this was before Amazon, and a lot of people didn't really understood what I did, putting minerals on the internet and selling them, and um, thought it might hurt the Tucson show, rather than my position, which was it helped it. So there was a petition to have me kicked out of the Tucson main show as a dealer. I didn't know any of the important people in the uh, mid-90s, but I knew Evan Jones, I knew Bob's son. He was a friend, Evan is here tonight, and collected minerals as well as dealt in them. And I went to Evan in tears. <laughs> you know, they might kick me out of the Tucson show. Evan, well, <laughs> hell, you know, what's going on? You live in Arizona, you know these people. I said, well, let's go talk to my dad. And that's how I met Bob, and the rest is history, and now we're here. So thank you, Bob, for keeping me in the game. I do have a few regrets in my life. <laughs> If, if I wander, can you hear me all right? Because I tend to wander. Yeah, he mentioned my age, sort of. Uh, it happens that a week from today, I'll be 92. Big deal. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'll share the secret of longevity. I have two secrets. The first one is I married a girl 20 years younger than me. Now, I won't go into an explanation of how they all that, uh, that helped me, you know, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, the other secret is that I became a rock hound. That's all. I mean, this is the greatest hobby in the world. Think about it. Think of all the, the, the field work that you can do. You, you know, go in the mountains and you can climb and dig and go underground and climb ladders and do all that kind of stuff. While you're out there, you learn how to appreciate nature and the wonderful things that nature has produced for us. And to top it all off, you end up with a group like this. You folks are the greatest. Yep. You're not going to learn a thing from me today. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna not, not going to learn anything if I don't know how to work this damn thing. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK. In 1936, I was 10 years old, and my my uh, elementary school teacher decided we should go to Yale Peabody Museum to see the dinosaurs. They had you know, the great dinosaur hall. Oh, oh boy, we were all excited, and so we went. It really was great. I mean, we spent a lot of time looking at, at these piles of bones. It was just wonderful. And, but after a while, I got a little bored, so I started wandering a little bit. And I went back out into the lobby where we had walked in. And right there was this big heavy weight on a wire that hung all the way up to the top of the tower. And it was just singing, swinging back and forth. Oh, big deal, you know. They had the markings on the floor. 
I didn't know what it was all about, but I watched and watched and watched, and then I walked away, and then I came back a little later, and the floor had moved. The, the uh, <laughs> pendulum had not, but the floor had moved. That, and of course, that's Foucault's proof of the Earth rotating. And that's the kind of thing that you run into when you get involved in this hobby. I was also bored with the bones after a while, so I went upstairs, and there was a mineral collection there. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I walked in, and here were these cases full of rocks, um, flat cases with rows of rocks and these pyramidal things. And, well, you know, so I began walking around looking at those things, and I remember that, that great big tall thing there, which I learned later was a stibnite from Japan, and in later years, I was able to go back to Yale, and I measured that thing. It's 22 inches long. That's an amazing thing. Yeah. I also learned that the farmers in that area used to use those as fence posts, keep their pigs from, <laughs> from escaping. <laughs> anyway, uh, other, other cases were level, flat, full of rows of things. And one of the specimens I remember distinctly, and I still remember it today, was not a large specimen. It was only about that big but it had other crystals sticking out of it. And this was a green, furry thing, and these crystals that were sticking out were kind of shiny, dark green. I learned later it was an epidote from Winter Sospachtal. I also learned later, to my disappointment, it was a fake. <laughs> so my whole, my whole interest in minerals starts out with a fake. <laughs> anyway, while I was in that big room, I looked at everything. And as I was walking out, there was a curtained alcove. And I went in there, and there was a whole bunch of just black and gray and white rocks. You know, just nothing great. But all of a sudden, the light went out, and this purple glow came into the, ca ca into the uh, case. And the minerals burst into colors, reds, greens, yellows, blues, white. Just fantastic. And there were switches on the counter there. So I began you know, playing with those. And the purple light went out, and the white light came on, and the white light went out, and the purple light came on, and then all the lights went out, and the rocks glowed in the dark. My God, can you imagine the effect that had on a 10-year-old kid? That's why every museum has to have a good fluorescent mineral display. I ended up, incidentally, doing my master's thesis on fluorescent minerals. Uh, my collecting was interrupted briefly, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, these are some of the guys I piled around. We were, we were all on, on track and all that stuff. But I'm the one down at the bottom with the, <laughs> with the girls. <laughs> anyway, that's what I collected when I was in high school. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember their names. Let's see, uh, I, I performed in the senior play with the girl in the middle. I dated the girl here on the left. I dated the girl here on the right. This guy ended up being my doctor. Uh, this guy ended up being my dentist. So we were a good group, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> of course, that was during the war when, you know, you ended up, uh, uh, what they did in, in when I was a senior in high school, all of the services would come to the high school, and if you took the test for their officers' training programs, like uh, you know the Navy V-12 and all that, or Air Corps, you got the day off from school. I took every damn test, <laughs> <laughs> and and I ended up in the Air Corps. Okay, and here's where I ended up. Don't ask me why, but I finally ended up at Roswell, New Mexico, and I was shipped overseas to an island called Kwajalein. And this was where they were going to test, in peacetime, the first atomic bomb after the war ended. And uh, so I worked on the Enola Gay, which was uh, the one that dropped the bomb on, on Hiroshima. And I was in a plane 20 miles away when the bomb went off. And that was interesting. I had these dark goggles on, and the flash hit, and I could read my instruments. If you looked at the sun, it was just a little orange something or other. And then the shock wave hit the plane, gave us a pretty damn good ride. And that was it, but at my age, 18, 19 years old, it was a lark. 
I didn't know what we were doing. But anyway, back to Yale. A friend of mine worked in the powerhouse there. He was a collector. I was, in fact, his name was Jones, Russ Jones. And he worked in the powerhouse, and at that time, the Bosch collection came over from, England, uh, from Europe and was housed at Yale. Uh, the family wanted to sell the collection, and Horace Winchell, the curator, decided, um, you know, if I don't tell anybody it's here, maybe the family will finally get tired and waiting, of waiting, and they will donate it. Well, Russ was able to get me in to see the clay. It was in a locked room down in the Klein Memorial Building. So I got in there and see it, I, and I remember some of the minerals, of course. Well, unfortunately for Yale, Paul Desitels heard about their collection, and within a matter of time, two moving vans, whoosh, it was gone. It was down at Smithsonian. Very foolish mistake by the Yale people. I, still, I collected fluorescent minerals and did my thesis on that, and uh, one day I decided that there, I was, I was sub subscribing to Rocks and Minerals magazine, thank God for Marie Heising, incidentally. Uh, they had columns like sand collecting <laughs> and uh, oh, a, collection, you know, a column on micro-mounting. You know. uh, and I thought, God, they ought to have something on fluorescent minerals. So I wrote to Pete Sodak. I said, how come you don't have a column on fluorescent minerals? He had a very good answer. He wrote back and said, because you haven't written it. So I wrote it for 12 years. And that's how I got involved in writing. Well, during that time, I, end, I moved to Arizona. I ended up joining the Tucson Club. And Bill and Millie Shoup, some of you older collectors and, and dealers, probably met, remember Bill and Millie. They were sort of the policemen of the committee. If you were a dealer and you were waiting at a, at a hotel, staying at a hotel before the show opened, and you were tempted enough to start selling some of your minerals, and they found out, you might not get a contract next year because their idea was you had to save all your best stuff for the show. And if you sold it ahead of time, you didn't deserve to be in the show. That's, that's an illegal thing, incidentally. But anyway. Uh, there we go. Uh, finally, by early 60s, I, I switched from fluorescent minerals, sold that collection, and I got into general collecting. And, you know, we'd go underground at the Rowley Mine and you know, all these other things. And, of course, I was involved with the society, and they asked me if I would help with publicity, which I did. Um, I was finally, I was eventually invited to be a judge at shows, and I ended up at the National Show in Anaheim. That was a great place to have a show because Bill Pansner and I had kids, and the, both families went over there, and while Bill and I were judging the collections, the women took the kids over to Disneyland, and, you know, got them out of our way. <laughs> while I was walking around at that show, somebody came up to me and said, hey, there's a guy that's got a booth here, he's starting a new magazine, would you be interested? He'd like to talk to you. So I went over to see him. It was Jim Miller, great guy. And I, he, he asked if I would write for him. I said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, I didn't care. And uh, so I started writing for him. I can't tell you how many articles, uh, I'm, I still am. I, I'm not sure how many articles I've written for this magazine. Uh, I stopped counting at 2,000. I figured, you know, <laughs> I've done enough. Anyway. Uh, Jim was a great guy. He encouraged me to get involved. And that and Rocks and Minerals and being on the show committee is what really got me involved with people. It was just wonderful. Uh, as the show moved along, uh, about 1979, I guess it was, Millie said to me, Bob, the, you know, our 25th year is next year. Uh, how about doing something about it, write a little history? So I put this thing together and uh, gave it to the, to the show committee, and they, they published a couple of thousand copies and sold it. Okay. I was home one day, and the phone rang. You know who that is. I, uh, the phone rang one day, and it was uh, a guy named Albert, Albertson. And he said, he said, we're doing a video on Gemstones of America, and we have a problem with our script. He said, I called John White, who was helping sponsor this thing. He said, I called John, and John said, why don't you call Bob Jones? Maybe he can help. So I got a look at the script. You, you remember the, 
TV ad with the dancing raisins, you know? They had minerals doing that. Uh, you know, good Christ. So I, I knew I could help. <laughs> so I ended up, uh, oh, we, went, you know, we, we had six localities in America with gems. The tourmalines in Maine, the tourmalines in Southern California, the sunstones in Oregon, the sapphires up in Montana, and the, and the peridot in Arizona on the Indian Reservation. So we went to all those places. And this is up at Mount Micah. And uh, John was in there scratching around trying to find some quartz crystals. I'm sorry I don't have the other picture, but they had a, they had a blast set up, and they had John. John was off to the side, and he was, he was kind of close. <laughs> when the blast went off, you know, here came the rocks. And <laughs> I had a photograph of John running up the hill trying to... <laughs> anyway, uh, another thing that happened to me was Bill Larson, of course, was doing the Himalaya, and uh, I said, you know, since I'm writing, I said, Bill, I'd love to do an article on digging out a, a tourmaline pocket. He said, well, I'll give you a call sometime when we're hitting stuff. Well, it happened at Christmas vacation. He called me. He said, Bob, he said, we're into it. We've got two or three pockets we're working on. Come on over. So I got Evan in the car. Evan, how old were you? About 12 or where are you? Probably about 19. Oh, you were that old? Oh, God, time flies. <laughs> Anyway, I didn't get to dig. I, you know, I'm off to the side. Evan piles in there with Ralph Potter, who was sort of the, the dean of uh, uh, pegmatites over there. And there they are digging. Well, in the time that they spent digging that pocket, they filled two five-gallon buckets with crystals. <laughs> you know, a great pocket. So I foolishly <laughs> said to Bill, I said, you know, Evan's going to want to have some of those. I said... You know, when he picks out what he wants, I'll pay it for him. I said, okay. So when we finished, Evan went through the buckets, and he picked out five specimens. I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> I was only a school teacher. Well, we waited. And, oh, and Bill said, I'm sorry, but uh, he said, I've got partners. He said, we're going to have to look at these and, you know, decide a value, and I'll let you know. So we waited. A couple of weeks later, here came a box in the mail with the five specimens. I was afraid to open the damn thing up. I figured, you know, I'd have to hock my car or something. <laughs> he, I opened it up. Here were the specimens and a note from Bill. We enjoyed your visit very much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you very much. These are yours. Signed, Bill Larson. No cost. That's our hobby. That's our hobby. I was in the office at the school at the, the Tucson show one day. I went in to get a cup of tea, just minding my own business. Guy walks in, he goes up to Pat McLean, says, "Is there somebody here who can go around with me and maybe talk about the show a little bit and some of the exhibits? I want to do a video." So she said, "Oh, Bob's over here. He'll help you." Okay, so off I go with this guy named Michael Labov, and we did the show. We spent a couple hours and. You know, I told him a little about the history and all this kind of stuff. And uh, that, that was, when we finished, he walked away, and that was that. Thought no, I thought nothing more about it, because I'd done that kind of stuff before. Well, it, at the Denver show, the following Denver show, here came Michael Labov, and he walked up and he said, you know, he said, I showed that video to the people at the University of Moscow, and they decided that you ought to come to Moscow and write a script for our video and be the on-camera host. Will you do it? <laughs> what do you think I said? That, and that's how all these events happen. You'll see that again and again and again. I never planned to do anything. It all just, you know, it happened. Anyway, we ended up, Carol and I went to Moscow, it was April, still damn cold, and I talked to Rock Courier before we went, because he'd been there several times, later. and I happened to be wearing a jacket that looked like an American flag. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, we talked about the weather, he said, well, it's going to be damn cold, so you got, you know, and, and the last thing he said was, ditch the jacket. <laughs> okay, so we were still in Denver. So Carol and I decided, you know, we live in the desert of Arizona, and we're going to be there in April, and it's going to be damn cold. We don't have kind of gear, winter gear, 
for that. So we went to the Salvation Army in Denver because I figured, well, they got to have some good stuff there. So we got some really crappy looking, but very heavy, warm things that we could wear when we were when we were in Moscow, which we did. We arrived at, in Moscow. Michael Leboff met us with his car, and it was snowing, and he took us to a hotel outside of town and said, I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock the next morning. Okay. Well, 9 o'clock came, no Michael. 10 o'clock came, no Michael. What had happened was he'd been in a car wreck. The funny thing was he'd already had his own car stolen. He had wrecked his partner's car. He, that day, he wrecked his nephew's car, and no one would loan him a car. <laughs> Well, Ludmilla was on the phone. She said, I'll come and coming to get you. So she took the subway out, and we were, the hotel was at the last, was within a mile or two miles of the last underground station outside of Moscow. Well, we waited and we waited, and she finally showed up, and she said, okay, let's go. So we go downstairs, and here's a guy sitting in a car, and he takes us to the subway station to go into Moscow. I said, who is this guy? She said, oh, I don't know. She said, I hitchhiked over here. <laughs> <laughs> and so we get into Moscow, and we, were, we, had, we had plans to go to the Fersman Museum, the Vernadsky Museum, the Gems Museum, the University of Moscow Museum. No car. So Michael, being a very <laughs> enterprising young fellow, he said, let's go. We've got the camera, we've got all the gear, all the cables, the tripod. So we march out, and we, Carol and I stood by the building on the sidewalk with all the gear, and he got out on, on you know, stuck out his thumb, negotiated a ride. And so that's how we got around Moscow that whole time, hitchhiking from one museum to another. We also went out to St. Petersburg. And it so happened that the curator at the Vernadsky Museum uh, Alexander Evkashev uh, had a good friend who worked as a curator at the Hermitage. So when we got to Mas got to St. Petersburg, and the train ride, incidentally, if you ever want to ride a train in the wintertime in Russia, don't. <laughs> Every car is steam heated, and the concierge in each car controls the heat. And the, the one we had had it cranked up. Not only that, but she loved Russian rap music. I can't stand rap music. You know, I'm a Glenn Miller guy. <laughs> you know how he died, by the way? You know how Glenn Miller was killed? Mm, you know, it's, there's some question about it. But apparently what happened, he was in a small plane flying from France to England after making arrangements for his band. And any bombers that went over into Europe and, didn't, and weren't able to drop their load could not land with a load. You know? So what they would do is drop them in the channel. And they think that what happened was bombers were coming over, coming back, and they had a load. They dropped them, and the eruption of water from all of those bombs got his plane. They think so. If you ever want to see his tomb, it's in uh, Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, uh, we, when we went to St. Petersburg, we went in the back door instead of the front door because we knew a curator. So I got to see stuff in the back rooms that you never see in public. And I mean, it was just wonderful. And the curator we, we were with was a curator of antique cameos. Now, you've seen pictures of these cameos that were done by the Greeks in the Romans, a gorgeous thing. And I had been told this guy never let anyone touch his cameos. So we went in his office and sat down. And he opens the safe. Of course, Carol was there. And he reaches in. He takes out a cameo. And he, we, we figured out that he could speak French. I could understand a little bit. So he walks over and he goes to Carol and says, pour vous, madame. And he puts a cameo in her hand. And he did that with about eight or 10 cameos. And Lidmilla was floored. She said, he never does that. He never lets anybody touch his, touch his cameos. So that was kind of a compliment to Carol. This is one of the things we shot later. It's a map of Russia, but it isn't a drawing. It's done in inlaid minerals, OK? It's all in Tarsia. The cities are rubies. The trails of the explorers of the early days across Siberia, the trails are done in diamonds. Speaking of which, <laughs> Russia has a lot of diamonds. In the Ad Almazny Fund in the Kremlin is their museum, and way down, maybe five or six levels down, 
in that museum. There's a room that's as big as a basketball court, and it's lined with shelves, and on those shelves are bags of diamonds. I mean, they could flood the world with diamonds if they wanted to. But anyway, this, this won the gold medal in Paris in, before World War II. It's a beautiful thing. Okay? It's all lapidary. Uh, jasper, malachite, lapis, and so on. Okay? When we went to the first museum, of course, we had a chance to handle some of the things there. That's the largest known specimen of Alexandrite that's in that museum. It's about five inches across. They had a single crystal that was as big as the palm of my hand. Just a cyclical twin, gorgeous thing. So if you ever get a chance to go to Moscow, be, be sure to go there. The Fersman Museum, incidentally, had been um, the, train, the horse training building for uh, Count Orloff. Gorky Park was Count Orloff's estate, okay? So his home was there, your horse training thing is there. And uh, of course, Orloff is the guy after whom a diamond is named. He was, of, he was one of the favorites of Catherine. And he, somehow he fell out of favor with Catherine. And so he heard about this big diamond that was for sale in Amsterdam. So he shagged himself across Europe and got the diamond, brought it back, gave it to Catherine, thinking this would get him back into her bedroom. It didn't. But anyway, at least there is now the Orloff diamond in the scepter of, of uh, England. I was at the Tucson show one day, and Dick Badoke, do you remember Dick? What a guy. When you traveled with Dick, it was like traveling with your own travel agent. There isn't anything he didn't know about where we went. We went to Europe together, we went to Africa together. Anyway, he came up to me one day, he said, Bob, you said, I'm thinking of going to Africa, you wanna go? Yeah, sure, <laughs> of course. So off we went. And uh, we got to see the uh, Sacco, uh, collection, Desmond Sacco, wonderful thing. Incidentally, most of the, most of the manganese mines specimens, his, his father was one of the big discoverers there, most of his specimens from those mines, he didn't collect himself, he had to buy them from the miners, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> He'd buy him back his own rocks. Uh, anyway, Dick, uh, Dick had this all set up, we got, got there, and we went, to, we, went, we went purposely during a dry season because there are lighted water holes there that you can go to at night and see the animals and they have to come in for water because those water holes are kept with water in them. So we went through the Atosha Pan and we stayed at a camp called Okakuijo. Very nice place, okay? Yeah, there we go. And from there we went to uh, Sumem. While we were at the camp, we were allowed, we were, when we checked in, we were given this thing about that long, it's like a sausage full of sand. And you know, I said, what the hell is this for? The lady said, well, when you go to bed at night, put that against the bottom of your door so the snakes won't come in and visit you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anyway, we went to Sumeb. Unfortunately, the minimal shops were closed. We did stay at the Miner's Hotel, of course, where all the dealers had been staying when the good stuff was coming out. That's a rich shaft. How would you like to have the specimens that came up that shaft? My God, you'd be rich beyond belief. I was at the Denver show one day, and Brian Lees came up to me. He said, Bob, he said, I got a friend who deals in emeralds. He goes to Bogota. And uh, moves on. He said, how would you like to go to the Emerald Mines? <laughs> what do you say to something like that? If somebody came up to me right now and said, how would you like to go to the moon? I would, I would, I'd, I'd give them a hug. I would say, absolutely, I'm on. But anyway, off we went to Muzo. And we, you know, you land in Bogota and then you walk across the tarmac through five different security stations. You get on a little plane, and off you go. Now, Bachner, the guy who, who was my host, was a pilot of, of a 747 for FedEx, so he, he knew his stuff. Anyway, we get to Muzo, and we're circling and circling. And I finally said, what the hell are we waiting for? Why don't they land? He said, they're waiting for them to clear, to clear the pigs off the runway. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I, we visited six different mines while I was there. And one of the mines was the Tekandama mine. When we got there, 
they, somebody said, well, now, the superintendent said, you know, I'll take you on your ground. I said, of course. It's, you know, I didn't come all the way down here just to look at the rocks. I, I want to go underground. Don and Jose would not go. So down I went, you know, I don't know, 150 feet or something like that, and step off into this mucky, slimy crap, because the emeralds, the calcite veins are in this really dirty, black, slimy, oily shale business. But anyway, we, we had to walk about 1,500 meters out to the working face. Now, those people down there are smart. They, the same in Cornwall. They don't remove any more rock than necessary. So from where I got off the ladder to the face, I walked like I had stomach cramps, because that's all the space there was. Of course, there was an armed guard with me. Everybody underground down there carried a gun. We get to the face, there's guys working, but I didn't see any, any emeralds. But they were working. Incidentally, they don't blast. They drill with what looks like an auger drill, and then they pack the drill holes with a material called S-mite. Remember somebody mentioning the coefficient of expansion of this odd mineral that shrinks instead of swells when it's wet? Well, they use, S mite is like that. They pack the holes with S mite, and then it goes <clears throat> and cracks the calcite. They don't have to blast. Anyway, as we were walking out, the superintendent went like this, and we go around a corner into a tunnel, had an iron door on it, and we go in there, and there was one guy in there working in a, a, a cal working a calcite vein, and you could see the emeralds, you could see the parasites, which are that, that's that cesium mineral, it's a good indicator of emeralds. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> there were several emeralds protruding, and I tried to get in and take a picture, the superintendent stuck his leg out, that's as far as I could go. So, but then he grabbed a rock hammer, chop, 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 stuck the emeralds in his pocket, and off we went. We got to the ladder, and somebody's, you know, you know I'm looking up at this hole in the sky up there, and uh, somebody said, how would you like to be hoisted out? <laughs> of course, that's great. So they lowered a cable with a rope loop. You sit in the rope loop, hold on to the cable, use your feet to bounce off the walls, and up you go. The only problem was they got me halfway up and the gears jammed. <laughs> so, and I wasn't about to jump, I was, <clears throat> you know, I was probably 40 or 50 feet up. Anyway, they finally got the gears loose and, you know, I had to climb out, which was okay. When we got outside, I said something to the superintendent and uh, he pulled those things out of his pocket and I said, you know, what's the, what do you think those are worth? He said, oh, 50,000. Just like that. While we were standing there, a miner came up. He was carrying a rock about this big. And right in the middle of the rock was a gorgeous green emerald. Oh, it was a killer. You know, and I'm looking at it, and I said, how much? He said, 35,000. <laughs> right, right there. And Bachner, who's standing next to me, goes, <laughs> I said, what the hell is that? He said, take a good look. So I, I did. What the guy had done was take a really crappy looking emerald out of its place, had put a little thin strip of green foil in the mold of the crystal, put the crystal back in and a little bit of calcite packed in there to hold it in there. That was it, right at the mine. So, yeah, fun. I happened to be there when they were when they were inviting the buyers in. <clears throat> it used to be they paid the miners when they'd hit an emerald pocket, the family member, and all of the good emeralds were collected by family members. They would collect all the good crystals, but they'd leave the little crystals because they didn't pay their miners. The little crystals were left, and then the miners could collect those, and that would be their pay. In the old days, they had to go to Bogota through the jungle, and that was a problem. You know, there were murders and all that kind of stuff. So. They finally got smart, and they were bringing the, mire, the buyers in from Bogota, and they assembled on the soccer or football field once a month so the miners could sell their goods. So I had my camera bag, and, and, which was bright red, and we're, you know, we're walking around, and I'm taking pictures, and all of a sudden my driver came up and he said, get in the car. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm having fun. Get in the car. Now, 
So in I went, Pedro or uh, Jose climbed in. The, dri the driver was the owner of the hotel. And he, he got in. I found out later everybody there, in the, everybody with me was armed. And we started out and, and through the crowd, and we were leaving. And as we went out the gate, there was a guy sitting on the dirt bank next to the fence. And he yelled in Spanish, take good care of your rich gringo. The rumor had started that I had a bag full of money <laughs> looking for a credit. They didn't know I was a teacher. <laughs> so anyway, we drove that night until dark and, you know, didn't have a problem. But anyway, that's, that's me coming out. Notice how nice and clean I am. When I, when, when I finished the trip and it was time to leave, <laughs> I left my, the clothes that I had been wearing, I left them there. <laughs> I was ashamed to put them in my suitcase and, and bring them home. So somebody benefited from that. Yeah, there's the face where the guys were working. Yep. Really quite a place. Another example. I had the funny idea of, I, I, you know, you remember Ed David? What a great guy. Wonderful friend. And uh, I found out somehow, he, he probably told me, that he lived next door to a guy named Malcolm Forbes. Well, Malcolm Forbes is not a collector of minerals, but he did collect Fabergé eggs. He had a collection of, I think, 11 of them, finally. So I said that one day. I said, hey, and I was, I don't know, I was going to be show, show chairman the next year. I said, hey, Ed, I said, any chance you can get your neighbor to, to uh, send us a couple of Fabergé eggs? That would make good publicity. He said, well, yeah, let me talk to him. So he talked to Chris, who was the son, and Chris ran the museum in, in, in downtown New York. And he said, yeah, you folks want to make a presentation, we'll consider it. So I put together a presentation, we made it, and he said, okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a couple of eggs. <laughs> so, I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. When I found out what, what we had to do, I had to raise the limit on my credit card because every egg had to have a curator, a guard, and a seat for the egg. Three first class seats for two eggs, six first class seats, and then in those days the club didn't even have a credit card. So, <laughs> but I did get paid back. So anyway, the other thing that they insisted on was they had to be met at the airport by a police escort. There had to be an armored car once they came out of the building and the, go directly to a vault. And then when it was time for the show, the armored car would go to the vault, bring the eggs with a police escort all the way to the show and repeat this every night until the show was over. And I'm thinking, my God, a police escort, all those things, that's gonna cost us a lot. So it so happened that there was a big uh, union, uh, policeman's union meeting one night. So I went and I made a presentation to them. I said, you know, we need these vehicles, we need the help, and it's a lot of money. And I said, the club would be very happy to donate a significant amount of money to your association if you can provide the escorts. Done deal. I think it cost us $1,000 altogether, nothing. And anyway, we got the eggs. This was the, the carnation egg that they had. That's actually not the, the one they had. While we were doing all this, I found out from an ad in the paper in Phoenix that th this company was selling replica Fabergé eggs, and they had invited Tatiana Fabergé to come from France and be at their store. She had just written a book on her research of the Fabergé eggs, and she would be there you know, selling, I ended up buying this damn thing for, for Carol. But anyway, we, uh, I, I've got to meet this girl. So Carol and I went down there, introduced ourselves, and I explained what we were doing. And uh, w when I explained what I wanted to do, she says, you know, I have a friend who's on the faculty at the U of A, and I can stay with my friend. Gee, that's wonderful. I'll be happy to come. <laughs> so I hope some of you were there when she gave her talk that Saturday night. Anyway, that's Tatiana Fabergé. She's the last surviving member of the Fabergé family. And uh, anyway, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, she actually came into town like on a Wednesday. Carol was her escort. She wanted to go shopping. So we, we really had a wonderful time with her. And uh, I also, somebody said, you know, there's somebody up in Denver who has Fabergé eggs. You really need to call them. So I called this lady. <clears throat> she said, oh yes, I have two Fabergé eggs, three Fabergé eggs. I'll be happy to bring them to your show. 
So I talked to her some more about it, and I said, where did you get these eggs? She said, well, I bought them from Fabergé in London. Well, I, I knew through my research that Carl Fabergé had not been in London. So I pursued it a little more, and it turns out that Carl, Peter Carl Fabergé had a, had a brother named Theo, and he had been sort of fallen out of favor with the family and ended up in London and opened up his own shop making Fabergé eggs. And this woman had bought three eggs from him thinking she was buying Fabergé eggs. So, but anyway, she brought them to the show, we had them on display, and I whispered in her ear later, I said, you realize, of course, he was not Carl, and that kind of disappointed her. Another guy came up to me, he said, how'd you like to go to, well, I have a friend with a chrysoprase mine, he'd like you to do some publicity. So Carol and I went to Australia, They put us up in style, I must say. And so I collected chrysoprase. There's a couple of rings Randy Polk did of the material. All of you like to go to the Sweet Home Mine? Well, that's what it was like when I went there in 1957. <laughs> I didn't find a damn thing. <laughs> but there's Brian and Paul, you know, two great guys. Got underground. Uh, George Liu, who wrote the book Minerals of China, I gave a talk. They wanted to know how the, Fer how the Tucson show started so that they could do the same thing, and that's, that's the result of that. Uh, they have mineral shops, of course, the Natural History Museum, Stonehenge. Uh, these are, I, I took a tour of 28 rock hounds over there, and this was all centered around Car uh, Carhaze Castle. This was owned by the Williams family. They owned 11, no, 22 mines in Cornwall, and uh, their collection was in the thousands. A lot of the good things that are in the British Museum came from that collection. They were actually home in Menabilly. How, how many of you have heard of Daphne du Maurier? Okay, the author. She lived in this house for a while, and this house gave her, gave her, a, oops, gave her a, an idea for an article, a story. She wrote the story. It's the book, Rebecca, and in there she describes where she lived in Manderley. That's Manderley, okay? The Crystal Skull, well, we'll, we'll skip that. And, oh, that's a fake. I, I talked to the curator, my, my granddaughter worked at the museum and, and, uh, and uh, she introduced me to the curator. They found uh, metal tool marks on this thing, it's a fake. Mitchell Hedge's father bought this at auction in 1942 in London. Another year I found out about rings that belonged to the Pope, so I invited them rings and here we, where we were. I went to the Catholic diocese and said, look, we're going to have Pope's rings here. Let's work something out. So they put, they put our people from Italy up in the, in the nuns' quarters for free and they kept the rings there for an extra day and the Catholic Church in Tucson raised $300,000 because of it. Well, you've seen these before probably. That's Cave of Swords, that's the big cave. The reason I got in there because a guy wanted a space in a show, he'd been there. I said, you can have a space if you take me into the cave. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, no, no, no. And, and this is where uh, Pat Haynes found Bob Jones site. It was in a, you know, petrified woodlot. Okay, that's my oldest son, Bill. Uh, sorry about that. I mentioned about Grove Street. Here we are back at Yale, and this is a, it's a round the world trip because I'm now on the volunteer uh, mineral advisory board at Yale. But I want you to get the idea that you are part of the greatest hobby in the world. Just just look around you. You're the greatest people in the world. We're very lucky. Thank you. <laughs>